you have the word with you, go ahead and open it to the book of 1 Corinthians. We are um, concluding uh, chapter 14 today. Uh, we have been studying all the way through uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're finally getting to the final chapters here. And uh, we've been in chapter 14, and we're going to be, again, concluding that today, beginning with verse 26 uh, through the end of the chapter. And so, uh, for again, for several weeks now, uh, we have been reading in 1 Corinthians about what the, expect, the expectations for our worship services are. Um, and so Paul is, is laying out specific instructions. So when we gather in this place doing what we, we're doing right now, uh, there are expectations of what's supposed to happen and how and in the order and all of those things. Um, again, how we've been learning how we are to come to church expecting to serve one another. Uh, not, coming, not coming for the motivation to be served, but in the expectations that, that I get to, I'm coming in order that I may serve you. Now, we, we talked uh, at length at the beginning of last week's message about what it takes to have that kind of mindset, right? And, that, and it takes maturity. That's a mature uh, Christian mindset to have is to be the motivation that I go to church is for those people that are going to be there. For me to be able to use whatever uh, spiritual gift that God gave me at the moment of salvation to be able to pour that out on, on the others that are there. And uh, now, I, I'm not going to stand here and disagree that there are times in our lives where we come to church needing something, right? Needing something. And, and, I, and I think there are situations and, and circumstances that sometimes happen in our life that it's everything that we have. It takes everything that we have, every ounce of energy and even beyond of that we can muster up ourselves to get up and to show up. I'm not going to disagree that there are times like that. But for the majority of the time, when I get up, and when I get ready to come to this place, it is to give. And, I, and I've said this last week, too. I said that, hey, if, you, if we had that mindset, guess what's going to happen? You're going to receive. You're going to receive in that mindset. As you, as you come with the motivation to give to others and to serve others, you, you are going to get what you're, what you're needing from God. Why? Because we're operating and functioning in the way that he designed it to. All right, and that's when it is working in, uh, on all cylinders. Things are happening, and, and we are able uh, to get from that. We also, again, uh, learn that we are not to use our spiritual gifts for our own benefit, right? But for the edification, which is the building up of the body. That's what we're supposed to use our spiritual gifts for. By the way, we get those spiritual gifts, again, at the moment of salvation, Right? We, did, we learned that as well, studying through the book of Corinthians. And so uh, that's when it takes place. And we also learned that uh, prophecy. Recently, we've been talking through uh, chapter 12 through, through verse 14. We also learned that prophecy is a greater gift for edifying the body in worship service, like this one. Uh, and we are now concluding this section of this letter that ends with the command for us to do everything decently, and in order when it comes to our worship services and gatherings because that's what brings glory to God and that's how his glory is revealed to those in attendance not by chaos not by chaos God is not glorified by that so if you have your Bibles and you're in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 we're going to begin with verse 26 and this is what verse 26 says it says, uh, what then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. So Paul, again, just pointing out major points of things that he's already said, making sure that we understand that everything uh, here is to be done in agape type attitude, the you before me. You know, let all things uh, be done for the building up of the entire 
body. So when Paul says, what then, brothers? He's like, look, I, he's like, so I've said all these things. He's really saying, like, what does this all mean? What does this all mean? And he's about to lay it out uh, for us here. Now, one of the uh, commentaries that I use in studying 1 Corinthians stated that with all these activities trying to go on at the same time, uh, it is giving the impression that the worship service had become sort of a competitive sport. You know, who, who, has, the, who has the greater gift and who can display it? And, and, and you know, we, all, we already know that the problems within the Corinthian church were uh, those that were trying to undermine others. That, that they had some, uh, what, what, what the term uh, that I use today for it is called elitist. They had elitist attitudes of like, we're the only ones who are spiritual, we're the, we're the ones that have these gifts. And, the, and then we also understood from Paul that the ones that had the sign gifts, such as speaking tongues, uh, uh, felt that they were more important. And, um, and so anyway, Paul, again, is, in, is addressing all of those things. We are going to read in the next verses, uh, all of these gifts need to be evident in the church body. And... Um, and all of us exercising our gifts in the service to each other, but not all the gifts are going to be in front of the church. You know, we have to realize that. You know, we, uh, you guys know that you guys have been coming here a while, know that, and we've taught it even in this series, that there is uh, no one in this church more spiritual than the other. Uh, no matter where we stand, when we, when we uh, express our spiritual gift, it doesn't matter. All right? Now, because of our culture, there's more emphasis put on those who are up front, right? Um, there seems to be, there seems to be uh, more uh, expectations, at least, uh, for those who stand uh, up front or who are in front. Um, and again, I, it's not, but it's not because anybody's more spiritual, right? Or, or those things. Everybody is equal. Uh, in case, again... We have missed it up to this point. Paul states once again that we're here uh, at church again. And I, I can't say it enough because I, I, it, it's going to take a lot to overcome this mindset. But Paul is stating again that we're here at church for each other. And he will state it again later in chapter 16 when he says, let all that you do be done in love. So again, this is, Paul's repetitive on this point because again, he's, he knows that he has to drive it home in order to overcome our natural tendencies of wanting to stand out, right? Or wanting to be uh, selfish or wanting to be self-absorbed or self-consumed. Let's move on. Verse 27 and 28 of chapter 14, uh, Paul again giving its specific instructions on this. He says, if any speak in a tongue... Let there be two or at the most three and each in turn and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. I don't know. Is that pretty clear? I, I, I just, I'm just asking, is it, is, I, I, I really feel like that Paul is like, like, like this, and this, and this, and this. Like, all of those things. This way, this way. And again, giving us clear instructions on the use of the gift of tongues. And making it specific that there has to be an interpreter. And this is the only way tongues, again, we talked about this last week. This is the only way that tongues are transformed into prophecy. It is when there is uh, an interpreter. Therefore, when it's turned into prophecy, then it is edifying the body. Now, the exercising of the gifts of the Spirit should not be done independently of the fruits of the Spirit. And I'm going to say that again because I think it's really important. The exercising of the gifts of the Spirit should not be done independently of the fruits of the Spirit. And that's what Paul is saying when he's giving these, uh, these specific instructions. Only in this way, the, the, use, the exercising of the gifts with the fruits, only in this way can it promote understanding, edification, and harmony within the body. 
So in case we need to be a little reminder what the fruits of the Spirit are, Galatians 5, and 23 lay them out for us, and this is what it is. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit, or the fruit of the Spirit, sorry, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so again, when we are exercising our gifts of the Spirit, they need to be accompanied by the fruits of the Spirit. Okay? They need to be accompanied by those things. Now I would like for just a moment, in, in light of what Paul is saying here in verse 27 and 28, would like to focus on the fruit of the Spirit uh, of self-control. Because again, that's what Paul is commanding the person to exercise instead of using their gifts of tongues if there's no interpreter. He's saying, hey, if there's not one, then you need to exercise the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. And uh, there are those in their eagerness uh, to express their gifts of tongues who would argue that not expressing the gift when they feel prompted by the Holy Spirit would be quenching the Spirit or grieving the Spirit if, if I don't exercise it when prompted, no matter what the other circumstances may be. Whether there's an interpreter or not, whether anything. They're going to say, hey, when I'm prompted, I do it because if I don't, I'm afraid it's going to be one of these two things. But I would like to look at those two things in Scripture to see the context of which they are used. Those phrases, quenching the Spirit and then grieving the Spirit. We find uh, grieving the Spirit uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, 29, verses 29 through 32. And so this is what Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. And, and you, guys, you guys just kind of help me go along to like see the context of when these things are used. First of all, uh, in verse 29, Paul says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now, in the context of those verses, when it talks about do not grieve the Holy Spirit, is there anything in there about not speaking in tongues? Is there anything in there about, like, those kind of things, like putting parameters on or if you don't do this? What is it talking about? It is talking about how we treat one another. Like our actions, are, are they sinful towards one another or not? There, there's phrases in there like slander and malice and, and do things like this. Uh, build up each other. Give grace. Do all of these things. So when it comes to grieving the Holy Spirit, you know how we grieve the Holy Spirit? We mistreat one another. That's how we grieve the Holy Spirit. We don't, we don't put the other before ourselves. We don't do those things. And so it really has nothing to do with... Uh, being prompted to show a sign gift and not using the sign gift. In fact, it's, it's kind of the opposite because Paul's saying, like, don't do it, <laughs> right? Because if you do it, it's not going to build anybody up. In fact, it's going to be harmful to the body. And that's what, that's what Paul's saying. The other thing when we find, when we look at uh, the quenching of the Holy Spirit, we find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 through 22. And Paul says this to the church in, in uh, Thessalonica. He says, well, he says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Listen to this phrase. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. What, what is the context of these verses? How we treat each other. Again, how we treat each other. And, and the fact that knowing that my sin affects those around me, right? That, that's what uh, is, is grieving, is quenching the spirit, is grieving the spirit, is those things. And then he goes on to say, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything and hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So that's how we 
grievous spirit is when we don't do that, when we don't abstain from the every form of evil. So both uh, grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit have to do with the way that we treat each other and the sins that we commit. That's what it has to do with. Another argument, um, again, from those who desire to express the gifts of tongues is that, is that they seem to be uh, carried away. And I, and I use loosely quotations on that. They seem to be uh, carried away by the Spirit and can't control it. But Paul clearly believes, from what we've read, Paul clearly believes that people who are inspired by the Spirit remain in control of themselves and are aware of whether or not an interpreter is present. In other words, the prompting of the Spirit do not contribute to confusing or unbridled outburst, but it is controlled. God is honored by order within His service. Now Paul, he also, here in verse 29 and uh, through verses 32 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul also gives instructions on prophecy as well. So again, when it comes to prophecy, he says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. You know, you know what's going on right now? This is, this is what's happening right now. You have, you have a prophet who is speaking. You guys are weighing in on what is being said. You guys are thinking about it. You're, you're uh, processing it. You're, you're going to be testing it. Is it true? Um, you know, I hope that that's what's happening. I hope that, again, not taking the word of, of whoever stands before you, no matter where it is in this church, but just taking their word for it, right? But to find out for yourself. So he says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first one be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets. Now, again, let others weigh. What does that mean? It means to evaluate carefully. It means to evaluate carefully. Nobody, again, who, who teaches here, who uh, speaks publicly, who preaches, uh, nobody on the radio or TV, again, uh, are, who, anybody who, again, claims to speak under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you should not just accept everything from those people, at, for, at least at face value, for sure. No one, no one, you got it? No one is infallible. No one. And no one is unanswerable to the church body. And I think a lot of times in our, our churches, that's been a perception. It seems uh, lately uh, the church has been uh, plagued with narcissistic leaders who are unable to have these kind of conversations. But no one, no one is infallible and, and no one is unanswerable to the church body. Now, uh, this is why, again, it is so important to be like we talked about last week, to be mature. Being mature, which we know is knowing what the word of God says so that we can evaluate what is being taught. And on the other hand, uh, as a church, on the other side of that, we don't need to be hypercritical either, right? Because it, the, 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 it can go both ways, right? You, you can either be, oh, I'm going to accept everything this guy says, or you can be on the very other end of the spectrum of just being very hyper, hypercritical of every, little, of every little thing or mishap or stumbling. or Like this morning, I've already made like 10 mistakes already in my words or my pronunciations or making something plural that wasn't that was supposed to be singular like I've done all those things you might not even noticed right but not to be again hi hyper uh, critical of those who prophesy 
First Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verses 20 and 21 uh, talks about these. And I, and I read this passage actually in the previous passage. But it says, specifically, it says, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. And then what? Hold fast to what is good. Take, take what is good, knowing that, that it's coming from an imperfect person, an imperfect being. Someone is just, just like you. So again, where, where does this mishap happen? It happens to what I talked about earlier. It's when you make, in your minds, somebody more spiritual than what they really are. And I think sometimes, so there's something about us. Uh, I don't know if it's only in this culture, but there's something about us that we want the person who is standing in front of us to be better than what we are. We desire that for some reason, but yet it always leads to somewhere bad. Why? Because it's not true. It's just not true. That we are the same. We are the same. We have the, do we have different Holy Spirits? No, we have the same spirit, right? We have the same spirit. Now, what, what are some differences? Maybe our calling, maybe our gifting, maybe um, response, some, some, some would say responsibility. Uh, there's some differences uh, in those things. But the fact is, is that we're all the same. We all have one spirit. We've all been given spiritual gifts to exercise within the church. And the truth of the matter is, is that we're all responsible. For this place. First John chapter 4. John gives us a warning as well. About testing. Uh, those who prophesy. Or those who would claim to be operating. Under the Holy Spirit. He says this. He says uh, in first John chapter 4. Verses 1 through 3. He says beloved. Do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits. To see whether they are from God. For many false prophets. Have gone out into the world. And by this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. So there is a, a warning there, too, of why we should be testing and evaluating carefully uh, what's being taught or what's being said. Now, Paul makes a statement here that may on the onset be kind of a little bit uh, confusing to some. He says, um, for you can all prophesy one by one. Now, but all are not given that gift. Because prophecy is a, is a speaking gift and not all are, are given that. So he, he, he's got to be referring to all of those who have the gift of prophecy, which we all should be seeking, right? So again, I think Paul is what, what he's talking about, and this is the best that I could, I'm telling you, it's the best I could come up with with all the study and all the books that I've, I've read on this. It says, I think he's talking about the potential for all to be able to prophesy. Uh, because he told us to, to seek the gift of prophecy. And so there's the potential there. And we all, we all need to know the word of God and to be able to explain the word of God on some kind of level. Right? I think, I think that's, that's the truth. Um, but not all are going to be uh, given the gift to be able to, to stand and teach before a group. In fact, uh, James even talks about that in the book of James. says not all of you should become teachers. Right? Because that, that has danger uh, within itself. But I do think that we all get chances to prophesy within the church. And, and uh, I think in, in our church, specifically since, since this is where we're at, I think this is best carried out or best seen uh, in our small groups and in our Sunday schools. Uh, where each of us has uh, input and are able to share uh, and encourage one another. I think that's where the things, they happen in those, in those gatherings uh, within our church uh, to bring it down to, like, again, where it's being uh, fleshed out here. All right, verse 35, 33 through 35. You would think that this might be the climax of these verses, but it's not. The climax is actually verse 40, but, but this is a good one. 
Paul says here, it says, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Now, when it talks about God in this way, Paul is sharing with the church characteristics of God. And so when it says God is not, he's not of confusion, but of peace, it's talking about God's character. All right. So it's, it's placing that on him. This is who God is. He is this kind of God. He's not confusing. Uh, he's a God of peace. And he says, as, as in all of the churches of the saints, the, woman should, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, these are lumped together here, verses uh, 33 and 35. And, uh, but again, I want to concentrate back on this phrase, for God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. So Christian worship is to reflect God's character. So that when you and I come to church, it should not be a place of confusion or chaos. That there's got to be some sort of order. Now, I, I don't want us to go to extreme on that where everything is shoulders up and straight. and well, That's not what we're talking about, right? Because we have freedom within our worship, right? We, we have their specific ways that, that God tells us to worship him that are not shoulders up, that are not hands folded. You know, it's not that, right? We, 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 we've learned that. We've, we do a great job here of expressing uh, something different because God requires something different uh, in, in our worship to him. Okay, so that's not uh, necessarily what we're talking about. It's just that it's just not confusing. It's not chaotic. And uh, that, that there's some sort of order that's happening here. And the, the, the deal was is that this was not the case in Corinth. This was not the case. Corinth was chaotic. Everybody competing. Everybody uh, expressing their gifts uh, at the same time. It was, in fact, it was very remnant of the pagan worship that was going on within their city. Of what was happening uh, within uh, the church that Jesus established. So you know, that's another reason why it has to be something different than that. Now, although, uh, although he's not speaking directly about the church in Corinth, James speaks very candidly about these same things in, in the book of James, chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Listen to James' explanation. And like I said, even though it's not specifically talking about the church in Corinth, he gives us a great picture of what it looked like. Okay? So James chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, oh, here's a word, demonic, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. So James here, he's, is he in line with Paul? Absolutely. He says it in, in, in a shorter way, right? More direct shorter but he's aligning exactly what we've been learning uh, here in first corinthians about church and about these things that it's not should be done in chaos so then we have the phrase uh, here as uh, in all the churches of the saints and so really what paul is meaning to do uh, by this statement is set the standard for church now would this include our church Yes, absolutely it does. Because this is for how many of the churches? All the churches of the who? Of the saints, which is you and I. This is, that is our identity in Christ. That is who we are. We are saints uh, because of his work in our lives. And so when he says that, all the church of the saints, he is establishing that standard for even us and all the, all the churches. Now we established early on 
in the book of 1 Corinthians when we were talking about uh, head coverings. So what Paul is, is saying here about women in churches, he's, he's not setting a new standard. This is a continuation of what was talked about previously when he talked about head coverings in church, okay? And so again, just want to reread that passage. He says, in all the, as in all the churches of the saints, the, woman should, the women uh, should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission. As the law also says, if there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, when we talked about those head coverings, we learned that the head of the wife is the who? Is the husband. Okay? Is the husband. And that, is, and that is what this verse has to do with. Again, Paul has already established that, that women can pray and prophesy, right? With the church, that, that's very acceptable. They can pray and prophesy um, at, as long, right, as they are under the headship of their husbands or the leadership of the church. And they are not doing those things in rebellion. By the way, who is the head of the husband? Christ, So it's not like the husband doesn't have a head over him either, right? But that's the order that was established by God. Now, this particular verse would go directly with the context of the verses around it, right? Because that's how scripture is to be interpreted and read. So it goes directly in context with the verses around it, which we're talking about evaluating prophecy. Now, we're all supposed to do that. But when women do that, they are to what? Do it silently. And as they have questions that are unanswered, what are they to do? They are to ask their husbands. Not speak aloud in a public meeting about it. Right? Not to question those aloud. That, that's really what was uh, going on. And so if there were uh, questions regarding what was being spoken in the assembly, the woman should not question the speaker, but should ask her husband. The wife, this is what it gives the picture of, okay? The wife's silence then would be a sign of her willingness to submit to her husband and not shame him publicly by speaking. Do you, do you ladies know that you have that ability? Not that men don't. It's not that men don't. But it's under, it needs to be understood that because I have this ability that's inside of me, not really by my choosing. It's just there. And we'll get to that. It's just there. So knowing that and wanting to be uh, submissive to Christ and in my worship to him, this is what I need to do. So again, uh, as a reminder and explaining to those, again, that weren't here when we taught through chapter 11 about this and uh, that it's not about equality. Again, what is all this about? It's about an orderly worship service. It's about not being, having confusion, not having uh, chaos, but it's about order, not about equality. Now, uh, Paul expounds a little bit the specifics on this in 1 Timothy. So he gives us a little bit more boundaries when it comes to this. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, 11 and 12, he says to Timothy, let, let a woman learn quietly with all what? Submissiveness. Submissiveness. Because this is her worship, specifically her worship to God. And he goes on to say, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. So why is that? Some of you guys have been to our, our couples retreat. You've been maybe set in couples classes. Maybe you've even uh, heard we, when we, you maybe have been here when we preach through the book of Ephesians and we get to chapter 5. And chapter 5 gives this long explanation about how... The husband and the wife are supposed to treat each other, how the relationship is supposed to work. And it boils down to two, these two main things, that the husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church, right? Putting her before himself in all those things. And the woman is to respect her husband. Why is that thing? Because the biggest need that God has put inside of men is to be respected. That's the biggest, that is our biggest need. And if we want our marriage relationship to work well, 
That needs to be taking place in the relationship. Right? It's just, it's just respect. It's not anything else. The same reason why a woman needs to be loved. You know why a woman needs to be loved? Because her biggest need is security. And security comes from that love. Security comes from the man putting his family ahead of himself. Right? It comes from those things. Now, ultimately, in both cases, ultimately those things, those needs are met by God. Right? And we need to learn that and we need to learn how to have those needs met by God. But the truth of the matter is when it comes to a marriage relationship, God is going to use your spouse to meet that need. Right? And that's the same thing that, that Paul is exercising here. He's like, look, just like we talked about in the marriage relationship, that should carry over within the church. That respect, that submission, just as, as the men are submitting to Christ. The women are also submitting to Christ by submitting to their husbands. Now, so everyone is, is doing what kind of action when we come to church? We're all doing what? Submitting. We're all submitting. So there's no one who comes to church who is not submitting. And in fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, before it begins to talk about the marriage relationship, it, it says in verse 21 at the end of that section, it says, submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ. So the reason why is just this. It's reverence to Christ. It brings him glory. I don't know how that works. I know that my flesh doesn't want it to work that way. I know my mind doesn't want it to work that way. Society says it doesn't need to work that way. So guess what? That's why it works that way. And that's why it brings reverence to Christ. It brings glory to him when things operate like that. When we submit to one another. And then he uses this phrase, as the law says. As the law says. Now, anytime this is referenced, this is, this is like the phrase that we read often in Scripture when it says, as it is written. That's really what Paul is saying, as it is written, as the law says. And so I just want to take us back into the Old Testament, which, again, is when it says the law, it's referring to the Old Testament. So I want to take us back as far as I can to the Old Testament to, to again, expound on this just a little bit more. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. So this is why, this is the conflict that takes place. This is why Paul has to give specific instructions about how, how order is supposed to be. This is it. It says, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire then, it says, your desire shall be contrary to your, what? To your husband. But he shall rule over you. You're going to want to fight against him. That is part of your sin nature. That's part of what happened to us in that moment. And so, it's, again, it is built inside of you, not really of your own doing. But that is why that Paul gives specific instructions around this. All right, verse 36. Verse 36. Paul uses a little bit of sarcasm here. Anybody, anybody good at sarcasm? <laughs> Somebody in the booth raised their hand. I'm not going to tell you who it was. <laughs> you guys understand sarcasm though, right? So that's what Paul is using here. He goes, or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? Is, is that very polite? Is Paul, is Paul being polite? Some of you might think that's polite, but no, he's not. He's not being polite. I think he's just, he just, again, he's just trying to get them to process this information on their own. He's like, you guys, you guys have to be getting this. Are, are you the only ones, right, that the word of God has come to? Are you the only ones? Is it, is it only through you that the word of God comes out of? Again, backing up his statement that he just said that this is the way that it is in all the churches of the saints. It's all the churches. It's not just you. It's all the, this is the way it is for all the churches. And um, so again, he's just telling them that they need to get in line with the rest of the churches that the same word of God has reached. It's the same word, not a different one, but different meanings and different 
instructions, which again should boggle our minds of why we have so many denominations. Why do we have so many denominations? If it's the same word of God, the same set of instructions, then why is Sunday still the most segregated day of the, of, of the week and the most divided day of the week? Verse 37 through 40. Paul then says, if anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, so if anyone thinks of himself as that, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If, he, if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. But all things should be done decently and in order. So in the beginning of these set of verses, Paul again is basically stating that if people do not recognize his instructions as valid, then they are invalidated as prophets and spiritual persons. Not, not that they are not saved. I don't think that this is what Paul is saying. Not that, not that they're not saved. I think they're saved. But what he's saying is, is that, that they are not operating under the influence of the Holy Spirit from which they claim they are operating. That, that's what he's saying. He's saying they, they, if, they, if they don't acknowledge this, if they, if they ignore these instructions, then it's not from the Holy Spirit. That's what he's saying. But there's, been, there's meetings after meetings and gatherings after gatherings. There are coliseums being filled with this kind of behavior. And I'm telling you, it is not from the Holy Spirit. No matter what it appears to be. And we have to know the truth. We have to be mature because we know the word of God and what it says. But if these things aren't being followed, then it's not of the Holy Spirit. So what other spirit is there? It's not of God. It's got to be from what? The enemy. The great deceiver. Right? The one who tries to mimic those. And we have to be mature enough to... Handle that and understand that. First John, again, chapter 4, verse 6. Um, we read from, uh, from that a little bit earlier, but this is what it says. John says, uh, we are from God. He says, whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So he's saying, like, look, don't deviate from what's being taught. Even Paul said that, right? If somebody brings another word of God that we haven't brought, even if the angel, an angel comes and brings a word that is different than what we've been teaching, even if I come back later and start teaching something different than I've already taught, don't listen. Paul says that. He said, don't listen to that. Don't listen to them. Because it's not of God. And finally, this is the climax of the passage. Verse, verse 40. But all things should be done decently and in order. Which means all things to the glory of God. Because that's what brings glory to God. Now, is, is that part of our mission here? Is that part of what we say we're here to do? Is to glorify God, right? That's why we, in everything that we, that we do, that, that is our primary focus. When we talk about uh, being vertical, that's what we mean. And we mean that it's all about Him. It's all about Him and putting Him on display. Not putting ourselves on display, but putting God on display. And this is, what, this is what unifies us. If we would all get on that page, where we'd be unified and not be like what James talks about, not having our own agenda, not having our own, you know, selfish reasons for, for doing certain things. Because when those things are taking place, again, it's not of God. It's not of the Holy Spirit. 
That's when chaos and confusion happens. That's when division takes place. That's when church hurt happens. Or in those, in those times and in those things is when those things are there. When jealousy is there. When all those things that James listed for us. And it's up to you and I to, to guard against that. right? To be mature. To come to this place. To exercise our spiritual gifts for the benefit of our brothers and sisters. To come with the attitude of serving one another. To be united on this one truth that the glory of God is all that matters. It's all that matters. I want to, in closing, I want to read you this quote from the Tony Evans commentary. And this is simply what he says, because I know this is what you and I desire. This is what we pray for every week. This is what we sing about in our worship. This is it. He says this. He says, righteous unity is critical for the church to experience God's presence in its midst. Because when we're not doing that, then we are quenching the spirit. We are grieving the spirit. And he can't, he won't work in that space. He won't work there. I don't know about you, but I, I, I do witness God working here. Is it because things are perfect? No. It's because that there's not mistakes, that they're, you know, that we've got this down. I think, I think he's working here because he knows our hearts. He knows we are trying. He knows we are putting forth effort. He knows that we are seeking this. He knows that we are working for this. We, we are moving in this direction. And I think he wants to be a part of that because that's what brings glory to him. That's, I truly believe that. It's not that we earn it or deserve it. But it's just the truth. As he operates in places like that. And I know from the testimonies of some of you that that is happening here. And we celebrate that with you because it's when, when it's happening to you, it's happening to me. And it's happening to you and it's happening to you. We, we've got to celebrate that with one another. That's how we encourage and build up and lift up. So as we conclude today, just to, to take all of this, I don't know, again, a lot of information, right? To take all of this and to just kind of put it in here. The, the questions, again, that we have to ask ourselves is, is, why am I coming to church? Why am I coming? What, what am I seeking after when I, when I get there? Uh, do, I have, do I have my own agenda or am I submitting to God's? Am I, am I hypercritical of the things that are going on? Or am I just lazy and just accept everything for what it is and I don't even know what it means and I don't know, I just trust. And all of those things, we need, to, we need some adjustments in that that can be led by the Holy Spirit. And I, can, I pray that He will do that in this moment. I'm just going to give us just a, just a brief moment to respond to God, to ask ourselves those things, to respond to Him in those things. And let him speak to us as we meditate on his word.